Okay. Good afternoon. Sorry. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And uh, we're starting our consideration of S-184, an act relating to defense of others and justifiable homicide. <laughs> and uh, we are joined by Senator Joe Bang. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the um, proper identification, State Senator Joe Benning from Caledonia County. I have introduced S-184 as a result of a correction that we all had made last session to a bill modifying justifiable homicide. The intent was there and correct. The tweak that we made left some... Um, cloud, I guess I'll call it, over whether or not an individual acting on behalf of another who was under threat of lethal force could actually move to protect that individual if the person moving to protect that individual was not under the same threat of lethal force. That's a common law doctrine that goes back centuries. You have the ability to act on behalf of another who is currently under threat of lethal force. The way that we had corrected things uh, sort of muddied that up and there were questions that came about. So I brought this extremely short bill, which merely attempts to correct that. And if you uh, remember, there was concern enough about it that both the chair of this committee, as well as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, joined in a letter to the governor to explain what was not intended. And this bill seeks to modify that um, to make it the correct version of what we actually had intended. And that's really all that I can say about it. Um, I do know that there are folks who look at uh, justifiable homicide and see that there is archaic language in there and want to bring other tweaks to it. Um, I tend to agree that there is a more in-depth conversation to have about that. But at this point, I've managed to get a quorum of the Senate onto this bill and I would hesitate to have it mucked up in any way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any. So okay. good, good to see you and thank you for your flexibility this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. We'll see you. Yeah. Take care. Bye. -bye. Okay. Eric, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So um, you could of a walkthrough. I guess a walkthrough is, is appropriate. Um, uh, but next, you know, just again, um, if you could reiterate what Senator Benning said and um, help us understand what this, what this bill does and does not do. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, this is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to talk to the committee about uh, Senate Bill number 184, which has come over from the Senate. It's an act relating to defense of others and justifiable homicide. It's actually very, um, although it's short, it's also very important language-wise to sort of see what's going on here and why, the, why this particular language was, was chosen. Um, the, uh, and that's gonna uh, require me to share the screen if that's okay, Representative Grad. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna look at a couple of different documents really quick and it should show everybody um, what it was that that happened last year, and this this involves last year's uh, Act Number One Twenty Seven, which was which was the Law Enforcement Use of Force Standards for Law Enforcement Use of Force Bill that I know this committee spent a lot of time with, and there's a lot in that bill, all sorts of things about uh, chokeholds, law enforcement use of force, that sort of thing, none of which is addressed by this bill. This this only deals with one particular piece of that uh, legislation that passed last year that has to do with justifiable homicide and defense of self-defense and defense of others. And that section, which is comparably small part of that, that other lengthy bill, uh, is the one uh, in which there uh, appears to be an ambiguity that was inadvertently created and that, um, that the S-184 attempts to create. So having said that, I'll just to point out to you what that ambiguity is, it's going to be helpful for me to um, just point out what the statute was 
uh, before you acted, enacted 127 and what it was, how it was changed in Act 127. So those are the two things we're gonna look at really quick, shouldn't take long. Um, but the, uh, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is the justifiable homicide statute that was on the books, uh, say roughly two, you know, year and a half, two years ago. This is what the statute was before you enacted Act 27. And, and we're talking about, again, um, self-defense and defense of others, both of which have been on the books for a long time, have been part of the common law for centuries, uh, the ability to raise uh, uh, when you, uh, another uh, person has been killed, uh, to raise as a defense that the killing was lawful, either because you were defending yourself or you were defending someone else. And we're going to focus on, in this case on subdivision two here, but you'll see that the language it provided that if a person kills or wounds another person, uh, then they shall be guiltless. Um, and that is under subdivision two, if, they, if, if the act was committed in the suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, burglary or robbery with force or violence. So in other words, um, if the actor uh, uh, either use force or you know, kills or wounds, as you see in the introductory language, if you have killed or wound another person while uh, you are attempting to stop that person uh, from committing one of those enumerated offenses, then you're not guilty. You can't be charged with the, the killing or the, or the harm that you've caused because you know, the theory is that you're trying to prevent the harm of one of these offenses. But you'll see the way the language is phrased there in subdivision two it's phrased as in the suppression of a person attempting to commit one of those offenses. It doesn't say they have to be committing the offense against you, the actor. They're just trying to commit the offense. So that's that brings in the concept of it could be against you, in which case, in which case it would be self-defense, but it could be they were trying to commit that offense against somebody else, in which case it would be defense of others. Either way, um, if you're attempting to stop that person from committing that crime, then um, then you can't be charged. So it could be self-defense, could be defense of others. So this was the statute that was on the books um, prior to Act 27 of last year. So then last year you passed Act 27 and that modified that statute. As you see now, section four of the bill, I'm sorry, of the Act last year provided an amendment to subdivision two that we were just looking at. Um, and that, enacted, I'm just trying to get all of subdivision two on the screen at once there. Um, and you see the way it's framed there, that uh, it, it takes a common law principle and codifies it. And that's this sort of expands on the, the notion of, of uh, the defense. And it provides that if the person reasonably believed that she or he or she was an imminent peril, and that it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force. Now that's part of the common law that has developed around this defense. So that's reiterating that. But you notice the way it's phrased, uh, if the person reasonably believed that he or she was an imminent peril and that it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force. See, it's, it's I think inadvertently uh, potentially excludes uh, the situation where the person believes that someone else was in, is in the imminent peril from one of those crimes. Remember the way that it was phrased and the way this defense has always worked, it can be not only self-defense, it could be defense of others, which would also uh, operate as, as a defense, as an excuse uh, for, for the conduct. So um, the, what happened, I think Senator Benning alluded to this already, uh, was that in response to this language at the very end of the session last year, the very end, the last few days of the session, uh, the governor sent a letter indicating some concern about uh, the language that limits this defense to a situation where he or she, in other words, the actor, was in imminent peril as opposed to other people. And in response to that letter, um, uh, chair, the chair, Chair Grad and Chair Sears sent a letter back to the governor saying, well, that, just clarifying that, that that wasn't the intent. The intent of this, this new language that you see in front of you was not to eliminate that common law defense, defense of others. Um, and so that, that at least that letter was on the books for the time being, uh, but the 
the idea of S-184, which you, you have in front of you now, is to clarify that. So that, that well, you have a letter on the books indicating, well, that wasn't legislative intent. Um, that's obviously to a court that was reviewing the statute now, as it exists now, wouldn't necessarily see that letter. Uh, and the idea is to change the ambiguity, potential ambiguity in the language so that you don't have it on its face. So that, you know, regardless of what other sources might be used to indicate what legislative intent was, the language itself would be clear. And that's the idea is to clarify that point um, in S-184, which I will now pull up. So you see, now go to subdivision two, which is just where this is the third version of this we're looking at. So this is the proposal in S-184. Um, you see the he or she is struck. So it's clarifying here that it's not just gonna be if the person reasonably believed, it doesn't say he or she anymore, it's the one in imminent peril. If the person reasonably believed that the person, in other words, the person themselves or any other person was in imminent peril and it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force and the violent suppression of et cetera, et cetera. So that's exactly the same as it was, <clears throat> but it changes it to clarify that it's not just the actor who might be in imminent peril, it's another person who could be in imminent peril as well. And that on behalf of that person, uh, as long as it's the other criteria are satisfied that it's uh, necessary to repel that peril with deadly force uh, in the, you know, when one of those listed offenses is being committed um, then the defense would apply. So that's that's the proposed clarification uh, to to uh, get rid of the ambiguity that may have been created uh, by Act 27 of last year. So that's what's done in Section 2. You'll see also, now that was the bill as introduced. In, in, in addition, while the bill was in committee, uh, there was a change made in Subdivision 1 above that. You'll see uh, there's another change there. And that's... that's um, Another um, another way in which self-defense can be proven. In other words, it's not just subdivision two that we looked at, which is about defense when one of those listed offenses is being committed, but also subdivision one, when you're, ne when you're uh, defending your own life or another person's life. So in that case, it's when you, you, it's not just imminent peril in other words, which subdivision two applies to, but it's actual uh, a threat to a person's own life or someone else's life. In that case, you know, the existing language, um, and I, I don't know the history behind this, but but the defense had been limited to um, uh, either defending your own life or the life of uh, your spouse, parent, child, sibling, guardian, or ward. Not sure the history behind that or why that was, but upon looking at that and certainly consistent with, with common law generally, the Senate decided, does it make sense that, that uh, why, why is the defense of the other person's life limited to one of those particular relations and shouldn't it be defending your own life or the lives of any other person and so that's why um, you see that change in subdivision one so uh, those are the and, and it, lastly also added in committee with subsection b this i think comes from the aggravated assault statute just to be clear um, that that uh, whatever other defenses a person may have uh, under common law that might they might also be able to raise that none of this language is intended to limit that, that all those defenses continue to be available and viable for the defendant as well. Um, so that uh, clarifying language was added also. And I think that's, that's the, yep, that's the upshot of the, of the walkthrough. I can take my, take the screen down now, that would be helpful. Sure, thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, Eric. That, that's actually very helpful. Uh, sure. Questions? <clears throat> Bob? Yeah, just a quick one, Eric. I noticed where uh, they had uh, uh, military officers and or uh, regular regular uh, military in there. Did they, what was the reason for them deleting that? I see they still have provost marshals and, and the assistant provost marshals under that bill. Just because it doesn't belong under state statute or military individuals? Uh, I'm not following that. Uh, where Where is that exactly? Under the original, the first one you showed us. Oh, the original law? Way down, way down to the bottom there. Oh, yeah.
I think that I think that that is a I don't know for sure. I didn't look into that piece of it. That was what that was uh, uh, the another piece that was done last year. It looks to me that looking at that change, it looks just like a modernization and up, updating of of um, older language that may be outdated. Um, yeah, I don't question. I just wonder why it didn't appear in the new version. I, I like the new version. Don't get me wrong, but I, I did see under Vermont statute that the provost marshals and the deputy provost marshals were included in the law enforcement officers in the state of Vermont. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but it was uh, Bryn who worked on this one last year, so I don't, I don't know for sure about that change. But I can follow up on that if that might be helpful. Yes, just, just curious. That's all. I don't, I don't have a problem. Just curious. Well, sure. So I have a so question. So. So, Bob, are you saying that 20 VSA 2351A, that those are worth? Okay, so those are. Those are. I think they're still. Under the old common law, the original one that we, we changed under, uh, what was the bill number? Yeah. The first one they put up, they had military officers and regular officers, the regular military in the. And under this new one, they don't. And I don't know if one of those statutes or whatever covered that, but I see in Vermont statutes where uh, provost marshals and assistant provost marshals are covered in this particular law. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Martin, I don't know if you're answering that or not, but I don't know if it's <clears throat> No, I have a different question. Okay, um, keep going. I'm gonna... Go ahead, Mar Martin. Uh, yeah, Eric, um, how, how does the court interpret and i know this isn't this is current law but i'm just curious how does the court interpret uh necessary defense of the person's own life um or um where's the other part i guess the 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 question is the the idea of well of the necessity yeah i'm sorry was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force or necessary defense of the person's life but well, how is the court interpreted that i don't know the answer to that that's a good question um have, haven't looked into that specific legal question but i'd be happy to look at some of the case law and see what uh what they might have said yeah and i guess it, it to, to be specific I, i'm curious if uh you know there's there's the concept of uh and i don't think our law says this at all a, a stand your ground kind of law versus a duty to retreat and and it seems like which way that goes uh depends on how the court is defining necessary defense of the person's own life i mean i would certainly argue that that language suggests that if you don't <clears throat> if you don't need to uh use deadly force on somebody in other words you have an opportunity to retreat then then it's not necessary but it would be interesting to understand how that's interpreted right right yeah yeah it's an interesting question i'll uh, i'll take a look at some of the cases and see what how that term has been interpreted i appreciate it thanks mm -hmm. anybody else so, uh, sorry, I had to step out, but didn't we look at this last year or the year before, something like this? This is fairly new, right? We, we looked at it last year. Like yeah. It was last year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, Bob, I'm, so I'm looking at um, these references here. I'm trying to find what you were referring to. Uh, I haven't found it yet, but. Do you still have that first version, Eric, under the common law? That you can pull back up on screen? Yeah, sure. Yep, I can pull it right up. <clears throat> I think, is that what you're looking at? Subdivision three there? Yes, subdivision three, exactly. Right. In the case of a civil officer, military officer, private soldier, when lawfully called that to suppress a riot or rebellion, my question was, I see it's not in this bill, and I'm assuming if they're called out, they're working under DOD and not state of Vermont statutes, correct? We repealed yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, we, we repealed that because 
I mean, was it was was it unconstitutional or was it anybody remember why we repealed that? It was part of the use of force. Unlawfully caused to suppress riot or rebellion or to prevent. We had a reason. I think it was yeah. because it was overly broad. I mean, to assist in serving legal process and suppressing opposition against him or her. I think there's a constitutionality there issue. Are been. Martin, do you remember? Yeah, no, that, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it was way too broad, uh, and and if if it was ever actually looked at by the court, which we didn't have any indication that it was, it could, would likely be struck down as, uh, as constitutional, unconstitutional. Right. And I think we also just heard from so many witnesses that said, like, this is just a complete, you know, get out of jail free card, basically, that renders. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, very, it was very counter to the use of force law that we put into place. I mean, it's kind of undermine that whole concept of the use of force law. I mean, it essentially says that for any purpose, essentially, uh, law enforcement could use um, could use force, and, and that would be a violation of, uh, it would be essentially a, a seizure, uh, an unconstitutional seizure. Right, right. And I don't, I don't think there was any disagreement. You know, I think I think DPS and everybody was on board that that part should be. Yeah, that, that should be killed. Right? Yes, I'm on board with that. I think so. So, all right. Well, I was just wondering why it wasn't there. So. Yeah, thank I you. Problem with it, but. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Good question. All right. Anything? Okay, so we um we do have a um some more testimony. It'll be we're told very brief on this um tomorrow. Uh, but we'll we'll be able to finish it up tomorrow. So. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Eric. Sure. Uh, okay. And so, committee, just in terms of looking at um, our schedule, what we didn't get to today, um, S-130, I'm sorry, S-113, um, medical monitoring. Um, we are hearing from um, Department of Financial Regulation, the um, insurance division, um, right at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So that will be helpful because I know that they did not testify in the Senate. So I'm glad that we'll be hearing from them um, in here. And I did just tell um, Chair Mark Cott of Commerce that um, that we are taking the testimony tomorrow in case he wanted to have anybody come in or um, or whatever, just give them just to give them a heads up. Because uh, when we did this the last time, um, it did go to Commerce. However, this is a very, very different situation. This this time around and yeah so we'll be able to also um tomorrow morning we'll be able to hear from marshall paul and paul and judge zone on 224 so pretty much taking the afternoon testimony tomorrow's afternoon testimony and fitting it into the morning i think we will have have the time because i we are not going to get back here <laughs> tomorrow afternoon or Thursday afternoon from from what I'm hearing. And oh. yeah, yeah. And then uh, so we'll see what happens with the Thursday afternoon testimony. But we can always do that Friday morning. We'll see how things are going with the budget and other things. And we are not meeting uh, before the joint assembly on Thursday so that give our members of um, judicial retention time to go over their report, whatever whatever they need to do and not have to, you know, rush after having a long night um, yeah. tomorrow and then a, a long day on Thursday. So, <laughs> yeah, serious? judicial retention gets so, special treatment. Are you on that? So let's...